by looking at uh, verses 11 through 23. And what we'll do right now is we'll read verses 11 through 18, and then we'll pick up at verse 19 and conclude our study this time at verse 23. So let's begin reading here in Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 11. I'll read to verse 18, and we'll get into our study. The writer writes, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And so, as we've been going through, especially chapter 10 here, and perhaps you've been with me as we've been journeying through this particular chapter, we've seen that, that God had established in the Old Testament what would be called a sacrificial system. The sacrificial system, though, has been declared to be incomplete. And the reason it is declared to be incomplete is because the system could not produce forgiveness of sins on a permanent basis. It could, in other words, produce complete forgiveness of sins. The sacrifices that were being offered could never cleanse from sin. They could never purge a conscience from dead works. And as a matter of fact, every time these offerings were made, it simply served as a reminder. It reminded people that they still needed to be forgiven. And so these are, in reality, what he's referred to as being a shadow of the things that were to come. The shadow that actually was foreshadowing Jesus Christ and his complete offering. He had already stated that it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins completely. He had said that in verse 4. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He came in order that he might replace his former sacrificial system. Verses 9 and 10 tells us he takes away the first that he may establish the second. In other words, this old system of sacrifice in the Old Testament has been abolished through Jesus Christ. So he's continuing now in verse 11, and he says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now notice how he says, every priest stands ministering daily. That tells us that he never could sit down and he never took a rest from his labors. It's a picture of constant effort, constant sacrifice. So this is ongoing service, something that never completes. It's never finished. Human priests needed to repeat the sacrifices both daily and on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus didn't have to repeat his sacrifice. He died on the cross one time for all time. You see, the offerings, according to verse 11, the offerings under the law could not take away sin. If they could have finally taken away sin perfectly, that, then the offering or the sacrifices would have ceased to be offered. And so they never actually did that completely. Now, in contrast, verse 12, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. On the one hand, in verse 11, you have a priest standing, ministering daily, but in contrast, verse 12, you have somebody who has made an offering who has sat down, and he has made one offering. Notice that, verse 12. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There's your contrast. The human priest constantly is offering sacrifices on a daily basis. It's a constant reminder that man is estranged from, from God because of his sin. But in contrast, Jesus Christ, one time for all time, lays down his life, and he is now pictured as being seated. He's seated at the right hand of God. So after Jesus gave up his life, he is seated. That's a picture of a finished action. The point is redemption has been won. The work has been accomplished. It's concluded. It is finished. When Jesus was on the cross, I've mentioned this to you guys before, and you know this already, it's recorded in the Gospels that he had what are called seven sayings. There are seven things he said while on the cross. One of the things that Jesus said is found in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 30. Because in John chapter 19, verse 30, as Jesus is there on the cross, Jesus simply said, it is finished. And the Bible says he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. When he said, it is finished, it's a reminder to us that salvation has been won by a one-time-for-all-time action. 
Because the words, it is finished, is really a single Greek word that speaks of being paid in full. So when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, salvation is completely won. He didn't go to hell to continue paying for sins. Sins were paid for on the cross. When he poured out his blood for us completely, one time for all time, when he died there, that's where salvation is won, in his sacrificial death and the pouring out of his blood for us. And so that's why he's pictured as being seated. And it's also, also pointing to us that he is sitting down at the right hand of God. As he is there in the right hand of God, that's a picture of power and authority. So Jesus, through his finished action, has power and authority that the, the priest didn't have. The high priest had to repeat the sacrifices on the Day of, of Atonement. Daily priests would come in in the morning for the morning sacrifice as well as the evening sacrifice. There was a constant rotation. When the evening sacrifice was complete, they were already preparing for the morning. When the morning sacrifice was complete, they were already preparing for the evening. It was a constant cycle, a constant offering. With Jesus Christ, and this is the point he's making, one time for all time, Jesus paid that price. So in verse 12, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13, from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And so not only is he seated in contrast to being to standing, but he is also waiting and is waiting for his enemies to become his footstool. The picture is all who reject Jesus Christ will lie helpless before him. That's something that I think is very practical, by the way. It is something to think about. Those who reject Jesus Christ. What is the Christian message? Well, the Christian message has a lot of things that are involved in it. One of the things, though, is that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You find that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Jesus Christ is presented in the New Testament as being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is presented as the one true prophet. He is presented as the Messiah. And it is not just for a short period of time until another prophet comes, but he is the last of a line of true prophets, which contrasts with all other religious systems, including, and especially in our day, the Muslim faith that presents Jesus as one of the prophets and Muhammad being the final and complete one. Well, Jesus would disagree with that. Jesus would say that he laid his life down on a cross voluntarily, pouring out all of his blood for the ransom of mankind. Jesus would say that every knee will bow to me. And that, though it's an affront to many people today, a billion people on the face of the earth would have a problem with what I'm about to say right now. Muhammad will also bow his knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that isn't something that's said lightly. That is something that is said biblically. That's something that is said New Testament-wise because that's what the Scripture teaches. It, teaches. it teaches that every knee, and when you think of every knee, that includes every person. That includes Sigmund Freud, and that includes Karl Marx, and that includes Muhammad, and that includes every human being who's ever lived on the face of the earth. Every human being ultimately kneels before Christ. And that's what he's pointing to, by the way. That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for that to take place. Verse 13, from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. He is the conqueror. He is the Messiah who conquers. And his enemies are those who oppose his dominion, those who oppose his authority, and those who oppose his power. Ultimately, the Bible says, all things will be subject to him. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, uh, Peter writes that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so the Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus Christ, in his offering of himself up on that cross, dying for us, pouring out his blood, actually uh, achieves salvation for us and also has conquered his enemies. Now notice in verse 14 how it says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I'll speak to you about this for just a moment here because, uh, well, I want you to see this, and I might as well just kind of like betray my hand here. I want you to see the word sanctified there. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's important for several reasons, and I want to develop this with you. Now, some of you won't be very interested in this, and, and others will be, and others will be in between. I'll wake you up in just a minute. Um, 
but you need to know a few things. Let me give you a couple of thoughts, and then I'm going to develop this with you about being sanctified. When it says in verse 14, for, one, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, his offering is sufficient for all time. That's why he's able to sit at the Father's right hand. And men now come to God and are saved completely because of it. But I want you to see in verse 14 how it says here, Now I want you to see this with me, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. When he says he has perfected, that word perfected means to make complete. The word speaks of carrying through completely or finishing or bringing something to an end. The point he's making is he has done what the old sacrifices failed to do, which is to set us apart. We are now set apart to God. It is something that is achieved, but is still to be completely received. Sanctification. When you read the word sanctified, sanctification has what is called a now and a then experience. Now, why am I going to bring this up to you? Why, what's the point? Normally, I would probably just share a little bit and move on. But I'm going to spend a few minutes here at this one verse, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is, is because recently, within the last several months, we have had uh, people from another fellowship, another church, in another city, who apparently have found it important to bring the doctrine that they hold fast to, which is called complete sanctification, they have brought that doctrine and have begun to kind of hand, well, they've handed out their flyers and they've handed out some tracts to members of this church. Um, three weeks ago on a Wednesday night, in the offering, we received a tract from this particular church, um, encouraging me, I'm taking it personally, to get saved. And um, so I did. But, um, <laughs> and so they really see and believe, and I've had some conversations over this, that, um, that you can become perfect here on the face of the earth, that you can have what is called whole or entire sanctification, that you can become perfect without sin, sinless in act. Um, and they've been coming to different churches. Uh, they come to Calvary chapels recently, and, and um, without attempting to... Um, you know, to cause you to run around all paranoid and everything. Um, you can generally tell them because there are several of them together and they all wear suits. And just wearing suit in this church tells you something. Mm, you know, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and because they believe that this wearing a suit and a tie apparently gives the appearance of holiness, being separate. The girls will dress, you know, with long dresses and they don't wear any makeup or earrings and things like that. So you can, you can generally see them. And, and uh, a few weeks ago, about 15 of them showed up to one of our Bible studies. And, and, uh, and I'm not really quite sure. And I don't want to call them uh, out and say that they're evil people per se. I, I, I don't want to go that route. But I do know that they're handing out, um, they have and some have handed out tapes from the church they're going to, CDs, and uh, I know that, that some tracts, some gospel literature, quote-unquote, that they have has been handed out to members of this church. I have uh, one of the pieces of literature on my, on my desk, and it asks the question, can a man be perfect? Can a man be perfectly sinless? And they're going to Calvary chapels. One of them went to a friend of mine's fellowship, and his youth pastor walked up to uh, one of the young people there who is bringing that doctrine, and He's aware of the fact that they're teaching that you can be perfect here on earth. And so this youth pastor said, may I shake your hand to the leader of the group? And the guy said, why? And the youth pastor said, because I've never uh, shaken hands with a perfect man before, you know. And, and it, we're kind of like, in a way, kind of playing with it, you know. But at the same time, it is a serious thing. Because part of what the problem seems to be is there's a sense that um, you, if you don't look in a certain way and act in a certain way, you know, if you don't have your hair real short and wear your suit and tie or whatever, um, that you're really not holy. And they have a tendency of looking at the young people. They point at everybody. I mean, they're, they're pointing at all of us. Um, 
and they'll say, you're just not set apart. You just don't look set apart. You don't have that set apart feeling and all of that. You're unholy. And, and in your church, you, you're speaking about grace and, and you're giving people license to sin. And you ought to crack down more on the people because they're living ungodly lives. And I've had a few conversations in, in that uh, genre and we've talked a bit about it. And uh, it's this attitude is when, when are people going to get it together? When is that church and when is your church going to become holy? And so they get their doctrine, it would seem, all the way back in 1700s through a guy named John Wesley. John Wesley is the guy who started what is called Wesleyanism, which eventually became Methodism. Methodist church, you may or may not know this, and so some of you may have been raised in a Methodist church. Perhaps you already know this. But in the Methodist church, they believe in entire sanctification. They believe that you can be perfect on the face of the earth. A friend of mine, a Calvary Chapel pastor, was prior to becoming a Calvary Chapel pastor, he received his doctorate out of, a, out of university, and he took his uh, ordination vows as a, a Methodist. And in the ordination vows, you, you affirm that you believe that you can be perfect on the face of the earth. John Wesley believed that, and John Wesley taught that. That Wesleyan doctrine found its way into what is called the holiness movement. And so the holiness movement is really encouraging you to live, quote, unquote, a holy life. Now, there's nothing wrong with encouraging people to holiness and godliness. That's what we ought to be doing. But when you begin to use artificial measures, the way that you look, the way that you dress, and even the way that you outwardly can act, you've got some problems going. Because as I was sharing with someone just today about this, um, the Pharisees, at a very outwardly, uh, outward appearance of holiness. I mean, when Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, it basically closed the door on his disciples because they thought within themselves, how can we become as righteous as Pharisees? Because Pharisees, just by virtue of their name, the Pharisee, the separated one, were known as being an outwardly righteous people. That's why Jesus spoke about them very often. That's why he would speak concerning uh, praying to be seen by men and fasting to be seen by men and giving to be seen by men. He would do that because that was the practice of the Pharisees. And they would take the robe, the, the hem of their, their robe, and they would actually broaden it and they put a band around it so that they were noticeable that uh, they were children, two children of God because they had this blue thread around the robe. Or they would have a phylactery that was real broad so that people would see that they were outwardly very religious people. And so all of their works, Jesus said, though, were to be seen by men. They were that way, not because they were truly separated, but because they wanted to have an appearance of being separated. And that's why Jesus said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful in appearance on the outside, but on the inside, you're filled with decay, dead men's bones, and all matter, manner of evil. That's what's inside of you. See, all we can do is look at the outer appearance. That's all I can do. I can only judge on the outside, but God sees the heart. And when a person is truly righteous, God looks past, and we used to say looking past the hair and straight into the eyes. God looked past the outward appearance to see the inner person of the heart. That's why when God was speaking concerning David, he said, David is a man after my own heart. You're not to look at the outer appearance because God judges the inner working of his spirit. And we're seeing that in just a moment. How God says, I will make them in those days to know my laws. I'll put them in their hearts. I'll write it upon the inside, not the outside alone, you see. And so, we are having some who are approaching us. We are having some who are coming up. And perhaps we'll speak to you. They may hand you a track. They may encourage you to, to come with them to a church that really is going to help you to become holy. Well, you need to know the process of sanctification. And let me share a couple of things about that with you that might be of help. Like I said a moment ago, this sanctified life that God gives to us is a here and now, and it's a then and there experience. You see, Jesus already has washed us clean from our sin. And we already, when we got saved, stand right before God in him. The day that you got saved, when you bowed your head in prayer, whether it was in a church service or driving in your car listening to the radio, whether you were raised by a, a godly mom and dad or, or whatever, when you committed your heart to Christ, when you said, yes, Jesus, enter into me, I need to be born again. 
At that moment, God did a work in you, and he washed you completely of all of your sins. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that work is done, and positionally now, positionally, you are in Christ. When you read the uh, epistles that the apostle Paul wrote, often he speaks of us being in him or in Christ. You'll notice that, especially in Ephesians. You can see him speaking about where we are positionally. You got saved, and according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you were baptized by one spirit into one body. So the day that you got saved, you were brought into the body of Christ. Positionally now, when you're spoken of, you are in him. We are in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You are in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, he said, You are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So positionally, and I could multiply that, I'm not going to. All you need to do is look for the words in Christ, and you'll find it all over the New Testament. That one, sanctified, you are brought into Christ. So positionally right now, you are in him. But you have something called progressive. Progressively, you are being sanctified. And that simply means that the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life, setting you free from the power of sin, from the domination of sin. That takes place after you're born again. Now, positionally, you're in Christ. You have what is called imputed righteousness. That means that, that the righteousness of God has been given to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We have righteousness because God has given that to us, because if we didn't have his righteousness, we couldn't enter into the kingdom of God because perfection is his standard. And because you and I are imperfect, we need something given to us that we don't have. So he dresses us in what the scripture refers to as robes of righteousness. So when you stand before God, you are attired in Christ. You are in righteousness. You're washed and sanctified. That has been a work that God has done, but progressively, you have a lot of work that the Spirit of God is doing in your life. I mean, the day I got saved at 20, I still had all kinds of habits that I thought were just fine. There wasn't anything wrong with some of the things that I did. I didn't think they were that bad. But as I began to grow, as I began to mature, as I began to read the Bible, I began to discover that some of the things that I thought were fine were things that God didn't have pleasure in. And so at that point, as I began to read the Word, I started saying, Oh, he doesn't like the way I talk. He doesn't like the fact that I like to drink. He doesn't like the fact that I like to. And, and you could just add whatever sin it is that you were entangled by. And, and, and I discovered that through reading the word of God. And, and so what does he do? Well, he caught the fish. Now he begins cleaning it. And the cleaning takes time. I've been walking with the Lord for 36 years. And so when I was 20, I had a certain disposition and certain way of doing things and certain attitudes that I don't have anymore. They're so foreign to me today. That sometimes I remember how I used to think or how I used to act, and I actually blush. I even sometimes find myself saying, oh, my God, I used to do that. Because sometimes I remember that. And some of you may do the same thing. Some of you may wake up and say, boy, I used to think that was okay. Boy, have I changed. What happened? What happened is God has begun that work in you. Now, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us this. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he begins a work, continues the work, and completes that work ultimately. And that's going to take a lifetime. And so what do we do? Well, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so the Holy Spirit will convict you that something is wrong. And you draw away from that. You might have a relationship with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. And you might think that having sex is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You begin to read the Bible. You go to church. You have some Christian friends who tell you, well, you know, that's called fornication. And you say, what's that? That's a big word. Never heard of it. When I was in high school, I didn't have a clue what the word meant, but I knew what it was. I just didn't know what the word was. 
And I remember somebody using the word in an English class. They said something about fornication. And I looked at them, and I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. It was just a foreign language. So I said, what are you talking about? What's that word? And they explained it to me what the Bible teaches, actually. You know, it's, it's having sexual intercourse outside of marriage. I said, you're kidding. It's called fornication? I just thought it was partying. No, it's fornication. <laughs> and it's a sin. I said, wow, that's heavy. You know, I never realized that, never thought about that. So after you get saved, you begin to read the Bible. You have some friends, and God begins to reveal some things. And some of the things that you used to think were okay, you're now made aware of the fact that they're not. So what do you do? Well, you confess. You say, God, I'm sorry. And what do you do? You forsake. Lord, I want to get away from this. And then what do you do? You flee. You come to the Lord, and you embrace him. And you say, God, you're going to have to give me strength because these are sins that I actually like doing. You know, most of the time when you're sinning, you like the sin. You, you enjoy the sin. If you didn't enjoy the sin, you wouldn't do it. So sin very often is pleasurable, even as the writer of Hebrews says, but for a season. Ultimately, you reap the consequences and you discover how bad they are, but it happens sometimes years later. And so what you have first is you have position. You positionally are in Christ. That is our position. We're brought in by the Spirit of God. But progressively, God does a work in you. And that is a work that, that takes a lifetime. Now, if anybody, if anybody in the New Testament could say, I have arrived, well, I think outside of Jesus Christ, who, who, who was complete, I mean, there was nothing that he had to do. Outside of Jesus in the New Testament, who's the most obvious person that could say, I have arrived, it has to be Paul. I mean, before the Apostle Paul was the Apostle Paul, he was a righteous man according to the standards of his religion. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he says, according to the law, the righteousness found in the law, he said, I'm blameless. I did everything, every jot, every tittle, everything that I knew to do, I did. And nobody could point a picture, a, a figure at him and say, Paul, you have not done the things that Pharisees are supposed to do. When he gives his testimony in Philippians chapter 3, he says, listen, I was according to the strictest sect of religious people in Israel. I was a Pharisee. He says, and I came from the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, I have a lineage that goes back. I, was, I studied later, he spoke to the uh, uh, on one occasion, he was given a defense, and he said, I studied on the pre under the premier teacher in Israel, a man by the name of Gamaliel. He was my mentor. I sat under this man, a teacher of teachers. So when it came down to knowing religion and knowing theology and knowing what it meant to be a religious person, the apostle Paul was that man. He was a blameless man according to the righteousness found according to the law. And yet, when he was speaking in Philippians chapter 3 concerning his journey, and this, this book of Philippians was written years after he'd been saved, this is what he says. In Philippians uh, chapter 3, 12 and 13, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that, which for, that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards that mark. That's what I do. I forget what was behind, and I reach forward to that which is before. But I have not yet apprehended. I am not perfect. The Apostle Paul could say, I am not perfect. And when you look at his life, I mean, who, could, who, could, who, in this, who, who have you ever known? Who will you ever know? that could speak like him, that ministered like he did, to the point of losing his head for his faith in Christ. He had a willingness to go anywhere at any time, even if it meant he was going to die, because that was the kind of man he was. And I just don't know anybody like the Apostle Paul. And yet when he spoke concerning himself, he said, I, I haven't arrived. I am not perfect. And so when somebody starts speaking to you about why you're not holy and why you're not perfect, well, Positionally, positionally, I have the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Positionally, because I'm in him, I can now stand before him because he has made me to stand. But progressively, God is working in my life, refining me, making me into a different person today than I was even yesterday. Because the longer I am with him, the more I learn of him, and the more changed I am. So you have one positional, two progressive, and three, you have the perfection. You finally have perfection, but that takes place at the very end. In Jude 24, he is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. 
So when you finally become perfect, it isn't here, though you may think you already are. You know, anytime somebody says, you know, I'm perfect, find out if they're married. <laughs> and if they are, ask if you can speak to the wife or the husband. You'll find out very quickly that perfect men don't exist. Uh, women already knew that, but we're just discovering that. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The perfection is going to be when you're in the presence of God. That's when it is finished. You have positional, progressive, and then perfection. It's all a stand. It's all, a, it's all moving from place to place. It all begins at the place of being saved. And so, back in verse 14, for by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I am in Christ, and he's working in my life. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, uh, for, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for a sin. Now, to me, verses 16 and 17 are incredible. They're beautiful verses, and we ought to embrace that because God has written his word on the tablets of our heart. Now, he's quoting Jeremiah, and uh, notice with me, incidentally, and I'll point this out very rapidly. Um, notice how it says in verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them their sins and their lawless Deeds. This is the Holy Spirit's inspiration who, who inspired Jeremiah to write. And he's actually uh, ascribing this work that has taken place as a work of the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is uh, the new covenant is now in effect because of the work of God through Jesus Christ. And what happens is God writes his laws on the tablet of your heart. He gives to you the will and the ability to perform that, that which he gives you the will to do. And you will do that which is pleasing to him. And the result of this is, and I, I love this scripture, verse 17, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. I will remember no more. Now, wait a minute. What does that mean? Think about that with me for just a moment. Can God forget anything? Can you picture him walking around heaven saying, you know, I can't find my keys? <laughs> you know? I don't know. Now, where did I put that halo? I, I, don't, I, don't think he does. I don't think he does that, okay? So what are you saying? I will remember this no more. What's that mean? I will not bring it up. It isn't something I'm going to hold you accountable to. Um, some of you young people in this room, you've done something wrong, and your dad and your mom have gotten mad at you, and they've lectured you and made you feel terrible over it. And then they say, you know, you need to leave my sight. You know, go into your room. And they're so angry. And then later on, you work it out, and they say, you know what, I forgive you. But sometimes a parent might say, but I'm not going to forget. You know, you've proven something to me. Now you're going to have to prove that you can be something else. Some parents do that. You might find this interesting. When my kids, when they were young and they did something stupid, which they do, oh, do they? Um, and it was like, I would, I would get almost stunned. I'd say, huh? How? I have just, I can still remember like, man, you have got, you, what, you, you know, I just couldn't digest this, you know. I taught you different, you know. Your mom's different. You think that's okay? And then I'd go into my lecture mode. You know, three points, an offering, and then a continuation. It's a series. But you want to know something? This is the truth. You can, you can, you can ask my kids, this is the truth. When it was all said and done at the end of that lecture, I would tell them this. It stays here, it's over, we don't bring it up again. It's done. And that's the truth. I didn't come back next week. I didn't say, look at you, remember what you, 
I never, I just don't do that. Because I figured that if you said I'm sorry and I said I forgive you, then it's over. It's over. It's under the blood. You asked forgiveness. I gave it to you. What else is to be said? To bring it up again later on? You know, sometimes, sometimes, I know this as a, as a little boy. I don't know if little girls are gross like this. But as a little boy, I was this way. I would get a cut, and I'd get fascinated with it when it heals. And I would pick at it. Did anybody ever pick at the scabs? And you know what? I could make it bleed again. It didn't take much at all. And then it would start healing, and then I'd go picking at it again. My mom would say, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> and then she'd look at me like, oh, God, you know, what happened? Did I drop you on your head when you were a baby? I mean, I can't figure you out at all. But I was fascinated by the healing process, and I would do that, and I would scratch it. And eventually, I'd get tired of doing it, and it would heal. You can pick scabs. You can open up wounds, can't you? It's not hard to do. You can open them up again. And I discovered a long time ago that if you, if you keep bringing things up, the wound never heals. It just doesn't heal. You know, so if I'm telling my kid, you know what? You didn't tell me the truth, and I think you're a liar. And they say, Dad, forgive me. I say, okay. Then a week later, they're saying, Dad, I'm going to my friend's house. And I say to them, how do I know you're going to your friend's house? You told me the other day you're going to your friend's house. You ended up going someplace else. Did I really forgive him? Did I really let it go? I didn't. You know, I'm keeping it in the back of my mind. So it has to be worked out to a point where we resolve this. And that's what would happen. That's why we had the long talks. Because I, I know when, when someone's just looking at me saying, yeah, I agree, yeah, I agree. I say, oh, you don't agree. You're just trying to get out of here. We're going to talk some more. We're going to talk till you're almost dead. You're going to wish I beat you. Anna's told me that more than once. Daddy, I wish you just would beat me and get it over with. Don't lecture me. I can't take it. I said, I know. That's what we're talking. If you got to take a bathroom break, go ahead. We'll be back. <laughs> Shouldn't have drank that water. But, you know, I'm absolutely touched by that phrase, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. He doesn't bring them up. They're done. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ. You are completely forever, completely forever forgiven by Jesus Christ. He doesn't bring them up to you anymore. In Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I'm not going to beat you with those sins. That's why that woman who comes to Christ and he begins to ask her after he had dealt with her and she had been accused in all of adultery and that's why when Jesus looks at her and asks the question, woman, where are your accusers? She says, I have none, Lord. And what did he say? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. You know, it's done with. It's dealt with. It's over. That's what you have in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be worrying about him saying, oh, by the way, um, I still remember what you did back in 1979. I haven't forgotten because the Lord says, I choose not to bring this up because you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is something that you did not have under the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was a constant reminder of your sins because offerings were constantly being made. But with Jesus, one time for all time washes you clean and you are now set apart by him. What a blessing that is. So he says in verse 18, now where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. Why? Because the sin has been made one time for all time. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter, by, enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we have now confidence to enter into the throne room of God via prayer. That's what we do every time we open our mouths. We're entering the throne room. 
this week, as we have our, our week of prayer and fasting, we're, we're being invited into the throne room of God through prayer. And we come there through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, that makes it possible for us to enter in. He speaks of it as a, in verse 20 as a new and a living way, which he consecrated through the veil that is his flesh. In the Old Testament, you had the holy place separated, separating uh, the holy of holies. And it was a veil. And uh, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, that veil was torn from top to bottom. And when that veil was to uh, torn from top to bottom, it, it indicated that our entrance into the holiest holy of holies is now made possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I can, with boldness, with confidence, I can come before the throne of grace and I can obtain mercy in my time of need because of that. We have what is called a new and a living way. Christ has opened the road that is not a dead-end street, and he's done this through his sacrifice. So as a priest entered the holiest place through a veil, we now enter in through Jesus Christ himself. Now, in verse 21 and 22, he's a high priest over the house of God, so we can draw near with a true heart. What he's saying there is, is an encouragement. He's saying you can have confidence and full assurance of faith. There's, you, you can enter in without wavering. Because on the Day of Atonement, blood would be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. But in our case, blood is sprinkled on our hearts. And in, in doing so, when God sprinkles on our, our hearts with his blood, he cleanses our conscience. We also have bodies that are washed with pure water, he said, which speaks of the priestly washings that they would do. So what has happened, as Christians, we've been sprinkled and purified by the blood of Jesus Christ and his word. Remember in Ephesians, in chapter 5, remember at verses 25 and 26 when when we were looking at that recently, how Paul said, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. We are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the word of God. And with that, we can now enter in with confidence. We have a true heart. We have an assurance of faith because we have been cleansed from an evil conscience. So what are we to do? Verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. We hold fast without wavering. God has made a promise, and so cling tightly to his promise. You know, it's interesting to me. I was this way, so I, I guess most every person in this room was probably like this. It's interesting how if my dad made me a promise, I didn't forget his promise. If my dad said, I'm going to get you something, I held him to it. I most definitely did. If dad said, I'm going to get you this, then, then every time he'd come home, I'd say, did you get it? Did you get it? Did I get what? Did you get me the glove? I told you I'd get it. I know you did. Did you get it? I could remember his promise. Could you remember if you received promises when you were a kid? Can you remember that? If somebody said, I'm going to get you this or give you that, did you forget? Most kids don't. My kids never did. My kids never forgot promises. They forgot to clean the room. They forgot to come home on time. They forgot to do an awful lot, but they never forgot. And they would repeat my words sometimes to me. Well, Dad, you said. And so it's interesting to me how children will cling to promises. And we'll, we'll say it. We'll say it back. You said, but you know what I discovered? I discovered I, can, I do the same thing with the Lord. I do the same thing. God, in your word, you said. I don't forget his promises. Sometimes I forget his warnings, but I don't forget his promises. God, you said. You said if I, you said if I, and I, and I can quote him right back to him. Lord, you said. Well, you want to know something? We have an assurance. We have a confidence. We can hold fast because God has said that he would give to us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And according to Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? If God said I would, then he will. My dad used to be a truck driver, and uh, he worked in Los Angeles. And on occasion, he would uh, take me with him, and I'd go in, in his truck, you know, and I'd sit there in the passenger seat, and he'd take me all over the place. And, and uh, you know, he'd take me out for lunch and, and all kinds of things. And it was during the summer when I was a little boy. And, and I have some great memories. And my dad used to go to Sears. The Sears, it was, there used to be like only one Sears that I was familiar with, and it was in L.A. We just drove by it the other day. Marie and I did with uh, Randy and Jeanette Walls on Friday. We drove down, and, and there's this Sears on the corner there, you know. And I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, man, 
I used to come to this Sears here, because it was the only one. Oh, we didn't have one where I grew up in Norwalk, so we would drive to LA to go to Sears. And, and, and it was like three or four stories, and it seemed like an enormous building at that time. And, and, and we drove by it just the other day, and, and both she and I, because her dad would take her by there sometimes too, and they'd go to Sears. And they'd say, well, there it is, there's the Sears. And my memory, I started remembering going there, and I used to go into the sporting goods section there, and I always would grab the glove, and I'd get the baseball, and I'd throw that ball into that glove, and I can still remember the smell of leather. I was a baseball player. I loved the smell of it, and I would hold it, and I wished Dad would buy me a glove, but my dad used to go to this one Sears because he worked just down the street, and he would buy candy, and he would buy, uh, what was it? It was peanuts that was covered with, uh, with a coating. I forget what it's called, you know, a candy coating on these peanuts. You guys would know what it is if I could remember. What's it called? Toffee? Something like that. No, it's not baked beans. Next? No. <laughs> I forget. I wish I could remember. If I can, I'll tell you. But you know what I'm talking about, and that's okay. It's candy over the peanuts. That's my dad would get it. And, and um, I loved it. You know, I just loved it. And I can still remember my brother Frankie and I one time. We were little boys, less than 10 years of age, and my dad came rolling up and pulled into the driveway and went into the house, and we were expecting him to get us something, so we ran into his pickup truck and climbed into the front seat there and opened up the, the glove box. And in the glove box, there was a, a bag of this candy. And so Frankie and I thought, oh man, this must be for us. So we ate my dad's candy. We ate the whole thing. I mean, we ate the whole bag, you know, oh, you know sharing it. And oh, it was good. And so, so we went into the house, and my dad was there seated at the kitchen table, and Frankie and I walked in, and we didn't want to let him know that we'd been eating all the candy. And so uh, Frankie said, Daddy, um, did, you, did you get some of that some, uh, candy with, in, in the peanuts? And my, my dad said, were you in my truck? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't in your truck, Daddy. Oh, you weren't in my truck? You weren't in the glove box? No, we weren't in the glove box. He says, good. Because if you'd have gotten into the glove box, you'd have seen a bag, and it had spider poison in it. <laughs> we said, really? Well, what's it look like? He said, well, it looks like candy with peanuts, but it's really to kill spiders. I bought it to kill all the spiders in the house. But you didn't eat it, did you? No. <laughs> he goes, well, that's good. Well, my brother, why, if, if, if we did eat it, <laughs> what would happen? Oh, spider poison kills. What you need to do is, if you ate it, which is a good thing you didn't, you would have to lay on your bed and take a nap. Oh, my brother looks at me, you know, I'm tired. <laughs> True story, I'm not making this up. True story. I'm tired, and I looked at him, I said, you know, me too. And we went to our bedroom, and we laid down on the bed, and we were laying there, holding our stomachs, going, oh, I wonder when we're gonna die. I went, I'll never forget that. So, my son David was about five years old, and I had some candy in the glove box, and he was next to me, and I could see him out of the corner of my eye as he reached in, and started eating it. I didn't say anything until he got his full. I just kept looking out, pretending I didn't see him. And then I turned to him and I said, oh, by the way, make sure you don't eat any of that stuff that's in the glove box. Well, why, Daddy? Because it's spider poison. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, really? I said, yeah. Well, I haven't had any. I said, well, just just in case. But you know, if you did have some, you have to cross your eyes, cross your legs, and stick your tongue out. That's the only thing that would save you from, from dying. So I look out the window, and then I turn and look back at him, his tongue stuck out, his eyes are crossed, and, <laughs> and he goes to me, I like doing this. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you do so. Why am I telling you this? Uh, I don't even know what got me on that one. But I better get back home. God's promises. God's promises are true. 
God doesn't lie to us. If God says it, will he not do it? And he doesn't play that, all, that old switch and bait kind of thing with us. So we trust him. Kids have a tendency of believing everything their father says. I am God's kid. I ought to believe what my father says. If my father says, I will cleanse you, I will not bring up your sins anymore, and you'll have eternal life because of my son, then I ought to hold fast to that. Hold fast, completely and totally, forever. And so that's what we do. He says, let us hold fast, in verse 23, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is what? Is faithful. If he said it, will he not do it? Holding fast to the end is an evidence of genuine conversion. In John 8, 31, the Bible says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Holding fast, not a superficial faith, but a real faith, because true faith has been called forever faith. To hold fast to him because he promised is an evidence that we've been saved. So Jesus Christ is the one who makes it possible for us to have a relationship with God and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're going to heaven.